Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Unstoppable Marketer Podcast. With me, as always, is Mark Goldhart, my lovely, courageous, I don't know why I said courageous, co-host. Hey, I'll take it. I'll take how, courageous. How are you? You're on your phone? Texting? Yeah, I am. Texting no, I'm me? I'm looking something. Yeah. Looking something up. How but, was your weekend? How was my weekend? I don't know. It was sad. My Donald? wife was supposed to get home on Thursday. Oh, that's right. She lost her keys. And she lost her car keys. And never found them. Never, no. So, she, so she, I had to She was mail her. at her family's house, which is four hours away from us. Yes. With your kids. With She'd kids. already been gone for how many, how long? She'd been gone for two weeks, but I was down there for six yeah, days. Hanging so out. in in between. But you were anticipating seeing them. On Thursday, and then they didn't get home till Tuesday because they had to wait for the mail to get to this tiny town. Wait, you couldn't have just like overnighted express them? I did. And it took that many days? Yeah, because I did on Friday morning. Oh, and then you got the weekend. And it didn't get there because they only deliver there to, um, until Saturday at noon. Oh, uh, okay. It didn't get there, so it didn't get there till Monday afternoon. And we have a one-year-old, so at that point, it's like you, you can't really leave till yeah. the next day. But they're back now. But they're back. Nice. So I got my family back. I'm happy for you. Yeah, that would be a bummer. Yeah. That would be a bummer. But more relevant to the nation is there was an assassination attempt. That was crazy. Absolutely crazy. Wild. Yeah. I've Suspicious. Been, I've, been even? Down, I've been down rabbit holes like <laughs> you wouldn't believe for the last like f- three days. Because what, what was it on Saturday? Uh, yeah. It was Our, Saturday. I mean, we were we had a we were had a pool Saturday, party. Saturday, Friday. House. I don't know. It was Saturday because we were swimming. And I looked at my phone and got a notification and was telling everybody. But yeah, there's some craziness. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, I've gone full blown conspiracy. Once in a lifetime event, I guess. I guess the last one was Reagan in the eighties. Yeah, survived. Um, it's the last I, attempt on a <clears throat> on a president or presidential candidate, maybe. Yeah, I think the so. The senator got shot at at Recently. a baseball game like four years ago. Four years or ago, something. yeah. Um, this was something that I thought was very interesting. So, um. Jack Black, have you heard this? Yes. You know, yes, you know who Jack Black is, or yes, you've heard what I'm about to say. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, to the audience then, Jack Black. Oh, who, do you want me to? Act? I I have no yeah, idea. You're what supposed you're... to pretend oh, like you don't what know happened? what I'm talking about. Jack Black, who is the well, yes, he's an actor, but many people don't know this. He is in a band called Tenacious D. Many people don't know that. I think a lot of people don't know that. What? I would venture to say that I think more people don't know that than do. Okay. Boys, are you lit up? Did you know that Jack Black was in a band? Yeah. Oh, nuts. Did hmm. you? No. Nope. Ah! I did not know that. All right. Who didn't know no, that? No, I did not know Nate that. Nate didn't know that. Nate didn't know that? How old are you guys? 22. 21, 22. I'm 21. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I guess people don't know that. Do you know the first... What, do you just know him from, like, Kung Fu Panda? You're little. 21? Yeah. Let's see. He had some, like, viral music video a while ago, right? Yeah. I guess with with the surgeons of TikTok, you've... Yeah, you, I think you a lot know of who Jack learned. Black is, but do you know... But you guys have never seen, like, School of Rock. I, not really. I saw the beginning of that, I'm pretty sure. I saw him sing the national anthem like, oh, he sings, you know, but... So no. I first wow. saw <laughs> I first saw Jack Black. How I discovered that he was a part of Tenacious D was in high school. I mean, he he's been a part of this band for. I mean, I've been graduated for fifteen years. Hold on, parental advisory. It's a pretty raunchy. Yeah, he's raunchy. comedy band. So <laughs> yeah, but he's Just a great FYI. singer. Like they're good. Oh, yeah, it's he's, good he's, music. He's a very talented musician. But I first heard about him. I think um, this was back before G- uh, Jimmy Fallon had the Tonight Show, and it was Jay Leno. And and or David Letterman, yeah. Before it was Kimmel and and Fallon, and I knew Jack Black through School of Rock, and I'm sure there. What are the other ones that he's been a part of? Uh, funny funny movies. Was it Old School? No, it's not an Old School. You th- that's Will Ferrell. What's the one in Orange County? Oh yeah, it's called Orange County. Oh, it's Orange County. It's called Orange County. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a great one. Um, but anyways, I was just watching it with my parents. They'd watch it all like. The Late Show Always, and he was performing, and he had flames painted on his belly, 
And it was just this like crazy guy singing the song. I'm like, that guy looks just like Jack Black. That's so crazy. And then my dad and I were watching. He's like, that is Jack Black. I was like, what? And then I like listened to his album. And yeah, in high school, you're right. It was raunchy. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. so Tenacious D, it's it's just two band members. So I'm also just talking it's hilarious here, listening but, to news anchors say Tenacious D. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyways, two it's too bad. It's just a guy who plays the guitar, very rarely says anything and sings. His name is, uh, what is his name? I can't think of it. Uh, Kyle Glass. Kyle. And uh, it was Kyle's birthday. They're on tour right now. And they brought out a cake. And he said, make a wish. Asked him what his wish was or something like that. And he said, next time don't miss. In reference to being bummed out that Donald Trump didn't get hit. Didn't get hit. Yeah. Or or didn't he got hit, but didn't get hit where they were hoping he'd get. Because they're both kind of openly non Trump fans, just like every celebrity is. Yeah. Right. And so Jack Black canceled his entire tour because of it. Like so much backlash. And now like Kyle and Jack Black, who've been a part of Tenacious D probably since you'd have to fact check this. But if I had to bet, I bet they've been around since 2003. I was going to say one or maybe even 1998. I mean, maybe they've been around for a long time, but like maybe their first album, first Tenacious D album, 2003, maybe 2002. I couldn't tell you because we, I discovered them in junior high. I discovered them, I think my sophomore year. Which would have been like 2001. 2002. Yeah, I think sophomore year for me was 2004. But nonetheless, this you know what's interesting Canceled. about that from a marketing perspective? Is A, uh, don't gloat about assassination attempts, I guess, or wish them on people, for one. Obvious. That's pretty obvious. That's just don't just, do yeah. that. But uh, B, what I heard was and the reason why it's it's interesting to maybe uncover this a little bit is because a lot of times you'll see a brand fail. Let's just let's, let's just like use this as an example of a marketing gone wrong, bad something bad happened and now they they've failed and they can't continue, right? So people can look at that and say, "Oh, it's because of the backlash and and whatever." But my bet is that there's probably a lot of people that still would have gone and seen them irregardless of what they said. For sure. Okay, For so sure. they were pressured into it. Um, but wait, what wait, I... They were pressured into what? Give it, like, splitting? Not split. I don't think they split. It's just like they had to cancel and they have to recalibrate, whatever you want to call it. I'm not trying to judge these people either. Sure, like, sure. people say dumb things in the heat of moments trying to be... Like, they're funny. They're supposed to be a comedy band, and yeah, yeah. so... Um, yeah, you know that comedians are going to come out and make that same joke, and they'll be okay with it in the in the yeah like, in the spirit of comedy. Like I, you know, I don't know if they actually wish that or not. It's yeah. just you don't say that. But anyways, nonetheless, what I heard is if you actually uh, open up the hood and figure out why they're canceling, it's because from what I've read online is these event spaces have to have some kind of insurance policies for when people come in and you have to cover X amount of people, right? And you have to take into consideration what other threats are coming in. And so because of the backlash that they received, these insurance companies are not willing to cover their concerts. Interesting. So it looks like it's Jack Black saying, we can't work together. But someone else said, if you know the event space, you know that what this really is, is it's just... Like you, you, they're unbookable right now. Yeah. Interesting. Because the insurance premiums are going to be so high to cover their, their events because of threats that have been made to them just because of the yeah. lightning rod situation that they've created mm-hmm. that they don't, insurance companies just don't want to cover those Wild. event spaces. So you knew more than I did. Um, the reason why that's interesting is because a lot of times brands are struggling, companies are struggling and on the outside, you can make assumptions as to why. And by the way, this is still, an, you know, we're still making an assumption here. I don't know that this sure. is 
for sure the verifiable truth that right. Jack Black and Tenacious D canceled their, their tour. But... Um, well, we know they canceled. We don't know if that is exactly... Well, I, yeah, exactly why they canceled. Yeah, yeah. And the same thing happens with marketing uh, companies and marketing in companies and companies in general. You, you can make assumptions about why a company is or isn't doing well, mm -hmm. but when you open up the hood, it could be a completely different reason sure. than what you are assuming it is. For sure. I like that. Like, oh, it's easy to like go, oh, it's that reason. Yeah. This is why. Yeah. But, and yes, like it, it's still related. Right. Like that comment created the insurance, but it's not the, the backlash it's, to the comment. Right. It's not that, that they, made them cancel. It's yeah, the it's backlash to the, to the insurance. To the yeah. Cause what it sounds like, what, it, what they make it, what they, the articles that I read, the, they make it sound like the mob got to them. Yeah, the backlash. And that's why they... And they're like, oh, like, we, we're so yeah. sorry. We didn't... Makes sense. When was Tenacious D started? You guys, did you guys get it? Yeah. Um, it says it started in 1969. No. Oh Wait, 1994. 1994. 1994. 1994. Wow. Wrong, wrong year. That makes sense, though, because I think he was doing that before he got big <laughs> in the acting scene. Oh, really? Also interesting, Jack Black's mom is a NASA engineer. Also interesting, my brother-in-law, who will never listen to this podcast, made it into, was it, what is the magazine, um, what is the big, Rolling Stone? My brother-in-law made it into the Rolling Stone magazine as a lookalike to Jack Black. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Does he look like him? Yes. Still? Uh, I mean, if he grew his hair out and beard longer, he definitely Put could pull it Put on some off. more LBs? Yeah, he definitely could pull it off but yeah he submitted it back like in like 2009 or 2008 yeah and got into i think it was rolling stone magazine so but on the, on the marketing front yeah let's let's we key read into, yeah we read an interesting going on like brands failing or failures <clears throat> as an actor business yep there was an interesting article recently that came out in uh, modern retail talking about Zombie brands, fire sales, and quiet closures are plaguing the D2C world. Yep. So zombie brands, de definition. Should we give a definition of these things? Yeah, give a definition of it. So the way the article describes brands like this are brands that may have been succeeding at one point in time, had really big growth, great valuations, um, and then they hit a wall. They may have taken on money as well. These a brands have often taken on, money. Have taken on yeah. money at these high valuations. And and when we say high valuations, it was probably what? I think peak valuations were 2020. 2020? Yeah. yeah, like right around COVID-ish times, there were or brands. Maybe 2019, Yeah, 18, brands but... that were getting massive valuations. Um, and, and oftentimes massive valuations not based off of profitability. Correct. But just off of sometimes revenue growth or new customer acquisition. Um, or I shouldn't say just off of that. Um, those things weighed more into the decision um, and the brand versus like how profitable the brand was at the time. So brands like, uh, you know, there's a lot of brands like uh, Outdoor Voices was one of them. Casper, the All mattress Birds. company. Allbirds, uh, Warby, Warby uh, Parker. Parker. You know, these brands that had these amazing... Amazing brands, stories, um, but had such high acquisition costs that have, have either since gone under or not even, they're not producing really anymore. Yeah. They're not what they so, so a zombie brand is like somebody who was excelling high valuations and then over the past few years, those valuations have not panned out and they've went kind of from peak down to lower, lower, lower. The brands or these people who've invested in them are no longer really getting or no, there really is no return in sight for them. Yeah, and a zombie brand could also be on a smaller scale, just a brand that's maybe appears like it's still sure. alive and well, but it's actually just a dead man walking. Yeah. Not necessarily just because of valuations, just because they're not making money anymore. It's, yeah, right now it's, it's sinking and <clears throat> they don't know how to get out of it. Yeah. So they might be treading water, but yeah, they're treading the water with crocodiles circling in on them. Yeah. Like, uh, the Peter Pan ride where 
Hook is in Disneyland. He's like uh, right between the crocodile. He's, his feet are on the crocodile's mouth as it's opening up. Have you been on the Peter Pan ride at Disney? Is it new? No. I have no memory of the Peter Pan ride at Disney. It's the most iconic ride at Disney. Besides maybe It's a Small World. What? Guaranteed. The Guaranteed. most iconic ride at Disney? Absolutely. Longest ride at Disney. Longest line at Disney. The Peter Pan ride? That outside, I guess I shouldn't say that. The new Star Wars one always has a bigger line. Okay. But the Peter Pan ride, which is just a little dinky kid ride. The most iconic? I would say it's the most iconic as a Disneyland lover. Hmm. I don't know how you can fact check that because that's an opinion. Look, but we that I will have, be a sound bite. I have not been to Disneyland. That will be a sound in... bite, and we will see how I, I bet that will be the most viewed reel I put out in okay. the next. Well, I've not last been to Disneyland months. in 25 years. And Just go wait, man. So I don't that line's always like an hour long. You're probably right, but when I think of I Disneyland, right. I'm like the Peter Pan ride's the most iconic, like not I guess Splash Mountain doesn't exist anymore. Not the Indiana Jones ride? I mean, the other two that would be more like on the more iconic would be Space Mountain or, or Space Splash. Mountain. Those would be the only other two that could compete with it. Really? For sure. And so there's good argument. I hmm. would though say actually the most iconic is It's a Small World because everyone knows that song. And But the longest, That's true. Yeah. Oh, it's, the, it's the longest ride. It's the longest overrated ride. I would agree with It's a Small World. Like you know that yeah. ride. Everyone knows that. People who've never been to Disneyland can sing that song. Yeah. But but the... Yeah, I have no recollection. Or Peter Pan. Pirates of the Caribbean isn't? I mean, it's great. They're all great. More iconic than no, the Peter it's Pan? No, it's not. But there's a point where Captain Hook is on the... Well, that's just in the cartoon, though. But it's a bit, But that's what all these are about, about the cartoons. Well, I know, but... I'm just saying, I think... All right. We've... I think the reference gone is the down cartoon. The road. Anyways, Peter Pan. Anyways... So we're bringing this up because I also saw like a LinkedIn post a couple days ago and it was just this guy who had just, there, there's this, you know, he's, he's a like talking head in the e-commerce space. I won't say his name, not that I think it matters, but um, he had just, he had a, he had a brand and he just had to close his doors down. Um, he owns a marketing agency, but he was just kind of posing this question saying like, how many brands have you seen close your door, close their doors down in 2024? And it was crazy. You know, like some LinkedIn posts usually... What happens in just like social media posts in general is you always have more likes than you do comments. Mm -hmm. But like this one, it was just like comments galore of just people saying my brands or oh X brand. You know, it's just so it's just crazy. Like the state of e-commerce is interesting right now. So what do you do? Right? There's tons of brands going under. I, well, I think first and foremost, it's important to zoom out a little bit and just realize that the state of the economy is interesting sure. right now. So D to C is just one subset of the economy and it touches a lot of facets of the economy, but, but there's some, there's some, but also like, let's, let's talk about that too. But there's some uniqueness to the D to C space too. Yeah. There's also, so it's like, yes, the overall economy is struggling and prices are up, but there are some industries, verticals, whatever that won't struggle. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like just because, grocery stores, you know, because well, you're talking about like necessities. Yeah. There's, there's, I mean, even non necessities. Like, I think I read uh, an article, I cannot quote it, but like the beauty cosmetic industry is, is better than it's ever been. Um, that, like that I believe. Botox, because people, plastic surgery, hair, TikTok. You know, it's like Instagram Reels has really blown up that yeah, category. There are things like that that, like, theoretically, you shouldn't be that shouldn't be growing right now because it is not a necessity, but people are treating it as if, as if it is. But it's interesting when you take a step back and think about, you know, yeah, it's great. It's great, like the whole mental health awareness thing. You know, um, it's good that there's awareness. However, it's interesting how self care has now been elevated to a need and a justified expense when in the past it would not have been. For sure. Because you can justify it on the basis of like, my mental health needs oh, yeah. it. And it's probably a lot of the narrative, right? Which is a good thing too, right? Because there has been like, there is a good argument to make that like... Well, it can and can't be. Yeah. yeah you I know, just, like, 
we're not here to make a judgment. Yeah, this is just about, like what it is. Talking about mental health, especially for things like, you know, even like six, seven years ago, for me, like that's when I first started, like that's when we launched Asher Golf and I was getting like four hours of sleep a night. That was like a, that was like a celebrated thing. Like I tell people that story and even me, like Kenzie, that's my wife. She would be like, you got to sleep more. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like I am crushing it right now. Like I am working a nine to five job. I'm taking five years off my life. And then I am like, I'm working till 2 a.m. every single day, crushing it on this other new thing that's going to, you know, and I like, that was like such a symbol of, such a flex oh yeah like i thought i was so cool yeah and it just killed me i mean killed my health legitimately killed my health i got six in 18 months i got the strep throat six times and i went to my doc i went to my doctor who was also my uncle and he's Pretty like gross he's like one more time and we got to get your tonsils out he's like that's usually the rule it's like five or six times in a year and you have to get your tonsils out you're done so and he's like and you do not want to ever mess with that as an adult it's like the worst surgery you can get that's not like life threatening but it sucks. Know? It's like it's a terrible surgery. So, sorry. Rab we were like, it, we're in rabbit holes. Well, I'm glad you made it out. Here I am. And now I'm getting a solid eight. But it, it's just interesting Haven't to think about since. how you can, from a branding or marketing slant, talk about self-care in a way that might be a little bit more on the superficial side, but like frame it but as... But it's justified as... That it's justified because you need to take care you of yourself. It. Yeah, you yeah. need to take care of yourself. 100%. Emotion, justification. That's interesting. Logic, yeah. So what, what should brands be doing, right? That's, what, that's where we want to get to, guys. Stick around with us. We've been down the rabbit holes. We want to talk about like, well, what, what are some things that brands can do to avoid the hole they could find themselves in? Or maintain, uh, sorry, hold up, not maintain, get out of the hole that they're in. Or ride maybe a little bit of a wave to then get to a better buying season. Because we also understand that summer is not the best buying season for most, most brands. There's definitely some brands that excel in the summer. But most of the time, you get summer lulls. Reason being because the primary purchaser in a house is generally a woman. And these people are oftentimes... It's just supply and demand. Like people are just busier in the yeah, summer. They're busier in the summer. So they're, they're on not, vacation. They got kids in the home running around. Ironically, people are busier in the summer. From a activity how shop. Per, yeah, like just yeah. from an activity perspective. So, And I notice it on my bill. Like my bill, you know, I like I manage the finances and I can see like my, my wife's credit card spending drops dramatically once June hits. More activity. Yeah, kids are home. Yeah, yeah like so from a just family naturally. perspective. Mine goes up. I even think from people without kids, you're I just, so too, yeah. you're going vacations, you're, traveling you're, or, you're enjoying the summer, yeah. you're camping or you're whatever. So I, th I just think you're not st stuck in So a, you've got time of year right now. Or building. But you got three things that are impacting brands, I think. And you might say there's more. Okay. But the supply demand we were talking about is just the amount of people on social at any given moment. Yes. So the three things that I think are impacting brands right now is you got the macro, the biggest thing, which is the economy, right? Economy is struggling. Inflation is up. If you're spending 40%, what did you see that? Did you see that one TikTok video of that dude who- The Walmart. The Walmart dude. So we might have to stitch this in it, but those- Stitch it. This Walmart guy, he, uh, I don't know, he's not a Walmart guy, a customer of Walmart who shops- A guy. Online. Yeah. Uh, apparently there's this feature in your uh, like previous orders that you can say buy again. And it was, was it like two years ago? Three years ago. Three years ago, he had bought, um, a, it was like $102 worth of groceries. And he said, he clicked reorder and it was like $450. <laughs> it's gone up like 400%. So, so you have this like macro piece that it's yeah, like, hey. 200%, but neither here nor there. Yes, you're right. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but you Approximately, this, like yes, 250 Yeah, you have but. this macro piece that's just happening where it's like, hey, there's just less money in people's bank accounts to be spending on frivolous things. And oftentimes in the D2C space, I shouldn't say frivolous things, non-essentials. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes in the D2C e-com space, uh, the majority of the stuff is theoretically non-essential. Right? Correct. These, Even though I need shoes, these Nikes are non-essential. Right? Right. Yeah. I need a pair of shoes. Like you but could, I could clean them to, or you could get, yeah. I could go to Target 
and I can get twenty dollars shoes versus these hundred dollars shoes or whatever. Or you could just use the old ones. And or I could just use yeah, exactly until they have holes in them. Yeah. So, but macro number one as a, as a company though, no one cares about macro, right? Because like yeah. they're still suffering. Yeah, exactly. They like, still so it's nice to know that they're not the only ones suffering. Hundred percent. Yep. Then but, you got seasonality. Summer. Like, yeah. It's harder. Okay. And then you have something that kind of ties into seasonality and macro, which is the presidential election. And that's going to impact things, right? Yeah. So, um, oftentimes just from a, one, dependent upon what happens, an assassination attempt, gas prices going up, something political, oftentimes people... It does seem like there's some black swan events that always happen on election years. Always. Always. (laughs) COVID. Assassination attempts. I mean... You name it. Whatever, but... So... But nonetheless, what if you're a brand, do? it's like, okay, it's nice to know. I mm. zoom out. I know that people are struggling like me, but like they still got to figure out how to win. Yep. So what if I told you there's brands that are not suffering right now? Tell me. Well, I will. <laughs> well, first of all, let's take a step back. We, we know... St- the stories personally of brands that would be classified as like a zombie brand right now or brands that have gone under or have really struggled over the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it would be beneficial for the listener to know why a lot of those brands are turned into a zombie brand or died. Okay. Brands that were seemingly on top in 2018, 19. Yes. Okay. So we already took the investment one. A lot of people took investment. They were trying to get returns. They they overextended. They were, just, they were and over, then their they came over evaluation down. almost killed them. Yeah. Right. But you also have brands that were they not did. necessarily in that kind of investment situation or a smaller investment or no investment that are still the walking dead or dead. Yep. And I think it'd be important to say, hey, why? Why? What happened? What why were they on there? top of the world in 2018, seemingly, or growing? They're going great 2016, 17, 18. And then why did so many hit plateaus come 19, 20, 21? Do you want to give a stab at that? Or do you want me to... What? I was presenting that oh, to you. just presenting the question. I thought that was a softball for you. It is a softball. Well, I mean, I, I, was, I, I think that both of us have... Just throwing it up for you. I think that both of us have very similar answers, but I think we're both going to approach it differently. Okay. Which is what I think we generally both all, usually do. Why wow, we're such great co-hosts together. Great. So my my thought, just one of the things, is in 2016, 17, 18, 19, you know, that like you're still, even though what pay to play year was 2018, right? That was algorithm year where everything changed. That was the year that just free reach and uh, you know, my Instagram used to be chronolo- more chronological. Yeah, chronologically. It was a chronological pretty much anybody, feed. Pretty much you're seeing, if you get on anyone you're following, you're going to see what they're posting. At, yeah, so if, somebody, right. so if somebody's posting a lot yep. every day, you would see their posts. Yep, top of mind. Every time you yep. log in, it'd be one of the first three, four. Yeah, so and, people and, just would post seven times yeah, a day, and, three and times a day. And just to let every listeners know who, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but uh, like I, I was a CMO during this time. And I remember like, I would just be like, hey, you know, guys, we haven't made you know, revenues down today. Will somebody post? Like it was, it was as easy as that. It's like, Hey, somebody just post. Will you like her and get a picture up and post? And then all of a sudden revenue would shoot up like an extra $5,000. Like, yeah, right, cool. Yeah. Sweet. Nice. Hey, let, let's get like, you know, Hey, will you post it like eight o'clock tonight? Let's see if we can get another couple grand. Like you, you that's, you can't really do that now. Like that's not how there's some <laughs> no. brands who are dominating on TikTok who can do things like that. Um, but it's, Maybe, it's not yeah. as, not as common. Right. So, Though these brands who are 2014 to 2019, you know, kind of started, they they had really dominant success riding on the coattails of just social media being easier. Um, I think that I read uh, yesterday that uh, no, no, I actually have to look this up because if I don't, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna say the 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 stat incorrectly here. Uh, there's this guy who I follow who just like does Instagram. Uh, you know, he talks about how to be better on Instagram. But yeah. It might have been a story. Anyways, I think that his story said a hundred million new posts happen every day. Wow. Or something like that. It's a C. 
Yeah, so it's like a sea of content. It's crazy, and I can't remember if that was across all platforms or yeah, if that was just across. Insta- but whether it was just on Instagram or you know, so that's what you're up against, you know. But it wasn't like that in 2018, 2019. So to to put that more clearly, I think a lot of brands understood how the algorithm worked back then. Yeah, and you because the algorithm was just chron. It wasn't really an algorithm; it was just chronological yeah. feed based off who you were following. There wasn't, you know, this incentive to try to capture attention in the same kind of way. So I think people followed the playbook of yes of the platform better. Yes. Yes, it's gotten harder. I'm not trying to say it hasn't gotten harder, but to just put this in like a framework, people were following what the, the platform wanted them to do. Yep. And they were doing it. Yeah. And then the platform started changing what it wanted you to do, right? Yep. It started prioritizing videos. And with the video and introduction paid and paid well. ads... But with those two things, it also, what, people's tastes started changing. Absolutely, yeah. So so they were following what the platform wanted, and they were giving people what the taste was at the time, which was curated, aspirational, which still works for some brands. Like, this is all brand independent sh- or brand sure, dependent. But sure, sure. Then people's chase. So people were following it, but then they started giving people what their tastes weren't anymore as people started shifting. Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, TLDR of what I'm saying, because I'm realizing that I'm at, like, I'm taking forever to answer your question. Um, people just weren't, have not been willing to change. Like, that. that's my opinion. Yes. These zombie brands, like, people have not been willing, I shouldn't say change, adapt. Yes. Right? What a lot of them have done is changed their roots. Have you noticed that? Mm-hmm. Hey, I, my, you know, my customer used to be you. But since things aren't working, I have to do something else. So like what a lot of people will do is like... Things got hard because the algorithm changed and people's tastes have started changing. But, but I'm Therefore, thinking that it's people don't like my product yes, anymore. So now so, I need to change so who rather, I am. So let's say I'm a women's brand, for example. I'm going to go now go into men's. And, uh, and I'm going to take my, my core team off of serving the current marketing market that we're winning with. And put more time, energy, resources, capital into trying to get men, but not putting enough of what I need into it and not doing it great and then losing. Yes. You know, you saw brands like, you saw brands like in 2020 and 2021, like uh, Madewell did that and it really hurt them. Uh, you saw, and Madewell, at the, like Madewell was at its peak probably in 2020. Like no woman, you know, was getting their jeans from anywhere else, but Madewell, it seemed like you know, or maybe Nordstrom. So, it did seem like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. My, my wife was one of them for sure. Um, but now like, I can't remember the last time my wife went to Madewell and got jeans when Madewell was known as the jean Mecca for women, for women. Okay. Um, uh, what, what was it? Uh, Athleta was, was also one of these brands and they went to Hill, Hill city. They created Hill city. Um, and Athleta was at its peak in the like athleisure performance before Lululemon was kind of like really, really, really getting super peaky and they put Hill City and that went under and now like I don't hear much about Athleta either. Not that there's, st- I mean, Madewell's still a great brand, I'm sure. And and so is Athleta. Like you see them in the malls and you see ads for them, but I don't, I don't know how great they're doing. So compared to, yeah, the, at that time. Yeah. So you've got people so have who they gone, have they gone to under or adapt they not in how they communicated. Yep. Um, and some of people took the lack of adaption by saying, hey, maybe we've hit our product, product life cycle. Let's change what we're doing. Let's go somewhere else. So I think there's two different ways and or both. Correct. Right? They discarded their current audience and they weren't willing to adapt to how people consumed media. Yes. TLDR. So TLDR, people just refused to adapt and change the way the algorithm wanted you to be uploading and producing t- certain kinds of content and they weren't delivering the tastes that people had adapted to. Exactly. And TikTok is also a big influence in that. Like the way people consumed totally. on TikTok changed a lot of the well, you went from, the type of content people wanted to consume when on social. Yeah, you went from polished curation. Yes. Right? Snapchat also. Yeah. Yep, you went from very polished curation to... I'm not wearing makeup. My face is in front of a screen. Let me tell you a really interesting story about me that for most most people wouldn't think would be an interesting story. Yeah. An interestingly mundane story. Right. That all of a sudden people are like, ah. Oh. 
we've talked about this. Like TikTok was just more fun. Yeah. I think at its core. Yeah. It was more fun. And I, that bled into Instagram and a lot of brands did not know how to yep. adapt to a, a more fun aesthetic. So ad, ad, adapting content. is the biggest thing, yes. I would say. I agree. And, and discarding your core audience is and another at, one. At the center of this, the brands that we have seen that have, by the way, it's not that they didn't go through any struggle, the brands that we have talked to and worked with, but they really honed in on the messages and the content and who and who they are serving, mm-hmm. right? We talked about this a couple episodes about, ago with niching down. Yeah. Like niching down often helps you expand, not contract. Expand by uh, expand uh, Pro- growth. Yeah. Growth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like the more specific you are, like the better you will be served. Yes. Um, o- oftentimes. Oftentimes. As long as you're doing, as long as you are doing something good for that niche and solving Yeah, because I think, this goes back to basic marketing 101. If you're looking at what your like total addressable market is, let's niche down really quick and talk about a specific time type of customer. So we've talked about like motorcycles or e-bikes. Let's take let's take e-bikes, but more specifically the e-bike, not not like a mountain bike that also is an e-bike, but just like a full e-bike, basically a motocross but with a battery. E-moto. An e-moto. So let's take an e-moto. Okay. Who are the people that are buying that? Well, a lot of companies would say... Everyone. Everyone. Every adult is my audience. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, let's go down further. Like, who's who's going to be the audience that's mostly interested in this? Like, who's, who are you going to actually be able to address about this? Yes, every adult might have fun on one. Mm-hmm. But there is X percent of the population that will not get on a motorcycle type yeah, maybe uh, you start with bike at all, period. So they're gone, right? Then you've got a lot of people that might just be like, yeah, that like that looks fun, but I, I'm not really interested. So, yeah. so you go all the way down and you're going to wind up with like 18 to 40 year old men. Yeah, I mean, you could also- That are going to be the most interested in it. Let me, let me also just take one more layer too. You could say families because families love to bike ride. So every, anyone who's a family. You well, can say that. But again... But once again, I'm saying that's yes, not it. Yes, yes. I'm just saying that... Oh, that every could be family another, should have one. That could be another... Okay, cool. Okay, if it's not everybody, maybe it's every family. Okay, if it's not every family, maybe it's people who like motocross. It's dirt biking yeah. families. People, families who are into and riding motorcycles. And I can tell you right now, people in that demographic are going to be conservative-leaning, typically suburbs or rural communities... For sure. Right? Like there's heavier subsets in different geographic regions, but like now you have a niche yeah. where you're addressing, some, like you know who this person is yeah. and the people that spend money on these things. So now yep. you have to address them. Yep. But yes, again, like, oh, everyone could ride one. They're yeah. fun. They're really fun. I think everyone should have one. It's like, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. But that's not, obviously it's not realistic. Right. And if you're talking to everyone and you're just showing uh, I don't know, like a businessman driving a his e bike to work to save the environment. Like you're not going to sell a lot. Yeah. Or just somebody on a mate on a road, like just uh, e- even if it is your market, like even if it's a twenty year old e moto. Sorry. You know. You know, even if even if it's a twenty year old kid with a American flag hat on, riding on the street, still might not work, right? Might not work, but you're getting closer. You're probably to get a little closer. Yeah. Right. So I like that. Niching down is one way that... Because you want an American hat and a mullet. Yes. And some pit vipers. And some pit vipers. Exactly. Right. And then a tank top. Tank top with like a scantily clad girl in a bikini. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you're going to probably attract a lot more people you, that are interested in, yeah, yeah. That in your product. So the point is, is like if you niche down, it doesn't... You're actually <clears throat> going to be able to sell more, yeah. generally speaking. So these the companies that have been able to adjust is they they focused on who their core customer is mm-hmm. and they adjusted their content strategy to be more personal, yeah, and relatable to that person, yeah. And and one way just to to, to let everybody know, like one way you can do this to figure like if you're not already talking to your customers somehow you should. I mean, there's tools you can do that. There's also just like. 
whether you're just like looking at your reviews to seeing how people talk or looking at DMs or looking at comments or, you know, there's ways that you can just start to understand. Um, and you can even utilize AI to put some of that information into AI that can then pick out commonalities. Mm-hmm. Um, um, or like I said, you can use tools uh, like Bestie that that allows you to survey customers uh, to ask them questions like, hey, like, what do you like to do? Who are you? Who do you, who did you vote for? Like you could, you could ask questions like, Hey, who are you most willing to vote? Like you yeah. vote for to understand political affiliations. You could, you can ask anything and people can just skip it if they don't want to answer it. Right. So there are several ways for you to figure out who your customer is. Whereas you used to may say women between the ages 25 and 50. I remember back when we were on the brand side, that that used to be how we think we were selling bags to women, and and it, our audience was like eighteen to fifty year olds, and then as we started asking people questions as simple as what's your age, we actually found out that our customer was twenty five to thirty five. So every every ad we created was always somebody within that age range. Every you know every message was to somebody who was, you know, if it was a pop cultural reference it was somebody who's going to understand things between 25 and and 35 versus yeah. somebody who is going to be we weren't talking about Brady Bunch right we were talking about full house. you know yeah exactly full house right so um there's several ways you can understand who your customer is outside of just yeah. guesswork the third thing i was going to bring up is it's interesting to think that i think in because of the the growth of D2C you had a lot of brands that were created and and we've noticed this with some of those zombie brands, right? They were created, but the f- the founders or owners or CEOs started taking this approach of like, this is just something that we're trying to flip and sell. Yeah. So they prioritized a certain type of growth over all else. Yeah. Instead of trying to create a lasting brand, which is, of course, paradoxically. Totally. The one that you're going to be able to sell for the most. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I always think people, every everyone points out, oh, I want to be like a Nike, but I don't think Nike operated as a, I think we're going to flip this in five years. Right. Yeah. It's a good point. That's a really good point. I think Phil Knight was trying to build a dynasty, so to speak, mm-hmm. a monopoly. He was trying to create a behemoth and dominate the sports market. Yeah. I don't think he was operating in a five-year mindset no no and in order to do that right to rather than be sales focused because there's a happy medium right it's like you have to get sales so you have to go for those immediate yes you want sales sales yes because it's it's what keeps the brand going especially if you're self-funded right if you're not self-funded that's different right you can put all the money and time and attention so the question is like how do you how do you sell and how do you build a brand right like what did nike do to become the brand it is and and they invest like b- well, back in the 80s on, yeah and, they took on investment and then eventually they did sell they ipo'd yeah. which is technically but you're in selling, the 80s but, and 90s yeah. cre- con- like to me like i always go back to content creation and and that's what brands need to be figuring out yeah um both paid and organic side of things and the the content creation game for Nike back then was so different than what content creation is today. Content creation for them and what you know, yes, they had money to do it, but it was getting athletes wearing their shoes. But before, like before, they had a lot of money. They were getting Olympic athletes who were running in Nikes without yeah. without being paid a, a cent. Well, well, right, but again, you got to remember, I, and I think it's important to think about the Nike story in this way. Nike started as a running company period. That's that's Nike's roots. It's with Steve Prefontaine yep. and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill Bowerman. And was, still is. Was the organ coach. It still is to their root, a running company. I I mean they're much bigger than that, but I still think I that don't they think would anyone thinks core. of them as a running company anymore. Uh maybe not with the the there has been a is deluge the right word? There's been a deluge of running companies who've come out. Did I use that correctly? I I don't even know that word. You've never heard of that word? No. Yeah. Oh, shoot. I don't know if I did it right. I thought a deluge was like a, an overflowing. I, uh, you guys might have to fact check me on this one. Like, you could be right. I, I just, I, I'm nervous It's not now. ringing a bell. I'm nervous now that people are going to think I'm super. I'm just blanking. There's been an overflow okay. of running companies that have come out recently. 
you've got on running, you've got Hoka that has like stepped up. Yeah. So you might be right about that, but but probably over the last four years, I think that's changed. I still think that people in the running space look to Nike as a premier company. Now I don't know if they do. Well, of course they're a premier company, but who are only I don't think if you ask running. your average consumer, what is Nike? They're not going to say it's a running company. I think you're right about that. But they started as a very niche running company. Sure. Right? Steve Prefontaine put them on the map. He he started the running craze. Not started, but he was maybe the, the face of the running craze that hit the 70s, late 60s, 70s in, in America. Everyone yeah. was running back then. We should bring on uh, Jordan Maddox. I think he said he's coming on. On the podcast, we'll talk more about running yeah. and its cyclical nature in America. Yeah. But... Uh, Sorry, keep making the point you're making. Started as a running brand, but they wanted to expand. Eventually, you kind of become, okay, we're a running brand. That's great, but running only gets you so far. Yeah. Okay, so they 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 were niche, but then eventually a niche can wear out and you have to expand. They were trying to get into basketball. Or it, can, it can wear out or it, like, it, it limits your growth. Yes. Right? It'll limit your growth. Yes, but a smart company doesn't try to expand too quick. Sure. So anyways... If you watch the show with uh, Ben Affleck, Air, Air, that's the point where they were trying to figure out, like, hey, we're not cool. In the basketball world, yeah. Like nobody wanted to wear their shoe. They weren't cool because Converse was Dr. J. You had Adidas, but Nike wasn't cool back then. Yeah, yeah. Nobody wanted to wear Nike. Yeah. So what did they do? My MJ. They put a big bet on MJ and they won. Yeah. Luckily, they won. Yeah. But. I think the story there is they used an influencer. They used somebody with a with an expanded reach or perception to now tap into a different market. Yeah. And they never lost, like you said, I agree with you. They didn't lose their running status. Yeah. But then they became a sport wear brand rather than just a running company. Yeah. An athletic company. An athletic company. Yeah. So so the 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 thought is like, so now we're starting to get into like, okay, so what, what do brands need to be doing? I, I think there's some like basic, I always call them like the pick and rolls of marketing. And I think a lot of people like, they get away from some of the basics because there are short term solutions that we're giving them big outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, b biggest one that comes to mind is paid ads. I spent a dollar uh, in, in Facebook and I got, two or three or four back. Right. So how do I just do more of that? And then what's starting to happen now is, is like costs are rising. And so with the economy, everything rises. And so your CAC, meaning your cost per acquired customer, your, your new cost per new customer, you know, let's say uh, went was $20 last year. It's probably now 30 or $40 this year um, for a lot of brands. And that's what's hurting a lot of these companies is, is the expenses is really hard. And so yep. if you were a brand that relied so heavily on paid ads, which most companies that started in this like 2018 world were those people because they hit the pay to play model. They saw huge, huge wins. They stopped creating content, organic content that, that people really, really wanted to view mm -hmm. new eyes wanted to view. And said, we don't need to invest in that. Let's put all of our time and attention and efforts into paid ads and let's roll because we're seeing immediate conversions from it. And now what's starting to happen is as costs are getting more, more expensive, you are now just like at the mercy of these paid platforms and what they're yes. doing. And and guys, we're saying Because it's this. the fastest way to get in front of the customer that you want to get in front of. Well, it's the easiest way. I'd say, it's the, I'd say it's the fastest. Fa fastest and easiest, maybe. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say an argument to that. Yeah, you could. I'll, I'll give you your I'll give you the argument to that. Okay. Yeah. And so you're you're having these people who've just like you, you're kind of like beholden now to the man when you do that, right? And a golden handcuff, if you will. Yeah, yeah, the golden handcuffs. And so, um. The question is, is how do brands get back to, well, and what they did with their content creation is content creation became almost an extension of their website. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's how I view most people now. Like most, most, most people. Well, yeah, because you can buy, yeah, like every social platform is just your SEO now. Very rarely, very rarely is 
a is a brand popping up in my organic feed, um, like on Instagram, for example, and I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. I need to follow them to learn more. It, it's just not happening. But what happens is if I see a paid ad from a brand, let's say, for example, like standard issue, right? I'm wearing a lot of their product right now. If I see a paid ad for these guys and I see it, I'm going to look at them and be like, oh, I, I'm going to go to their web, I'm going to go to their Instagram because I want to see how this outfit looks on a model. And so that's what I mean by the ex- it, content creation becomes an extension of the website, mm-hmm. which isn't a bad thing, but it's not bringing brands organic distribution anymore. Whereas it used to. Correct. It used to bring new eyeballs to the website and, but content, most people's content creation is not doing that. Because and, they're not, they're, they're not adjusting. They're not adjusting. Exactly. Going yeah. back to it. So I think one of the biggest things that brands can and need to be doing is how do you, how do you switch gears and say, okay, how do I make my paid ad strategy as efficient as possible? Yes, you keep doing that. But how do you maybe take some of that budget away and invest it into a content creation strategy that isn't an extension of the website, but becomes a distribution channel that enhances what you're doing on your paid ad side? Yeah, essentially going back to 2016, how do you play the game the way it's supposed to be Yeah, played? you were playing it. We were all playing it then, right? Like I remember- It was just cheaper to do it back then because it was photos- and, you know, you'd edit the photos, but now it's videos. Oh, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't though. Because uh, like, I can tell you on the brand side, like we, we spent like $90,000. On and, photos. Uh, and we were an under $10 million brand. We spent $90,000 $90, on a trip to Europe for photo shoot. And we used, I counted, I counted, we used of like the thousand photos that we took, we probably used 30 of those photos on social media. And it wasn't super uncommon to do things like that. No, not at all. So like, then. so you're, you're, you're right in some regards. I think what's happening now is it's cheaper to make organic content now, it, but it's harder. Does that make sense? It's harder to figure out the stuff that's going to hit and to find the person See, that's who that's why I think it. it's actually more expensive is because you have to have a face. Sh- sure, yeah. Like you I have guess. to hire the right person to make sure that you are getting... That's a good the right point. content creator. So vers- versus like... Which some owners are great at, and so maybe that's not an additional cost, but totally. it's cheaper. Totally. To your so like point. But a lot of brands don't know how to adjust, and they need to get someone in there to do it. 2018, you could get somebody right out of college to just yes. be a, what's called a social media manager. Yeah, And you're very not going to pay them a ton of money. What's happening is you're taking the content that you went out and produced, the high, high, high-end content, and they're now posting it. Where it's the other way around. It's like, hey... There's an argument to make about good, high-quality content. Like, we work with the folks over at Film Lab who can create really, really awesome, high-quality content. And a lot of that can be good, really good use for ads or sizzle reels or um, website stuff and even and even organic stuff, too. Right. But what people want right now is they want to see into the brand. They want to know who the founders are. They want to know who's working there. Where They want to know more about the brand and less about the product and how it might solve their problems. Yes. Which seems counterintuitive, right? To me, it's not counterintuitive because you need everything. Going back to but Nike. But a brand could see it that way. I know, right? I know. But going back to the Nike example to help maybe some marketers and brands contextualize this, Nike has always had curated advertising. Right. But, right, they handed their shoes off to athletes that had their own characters. Yeah. And yes, you yes, there's parameters, you know, around who you sponsor and stuff like that. But yeah. to an extent, you got to think in that framework, that was very similar to what you're saying is like, hey, people wanted to see a cool person wearing Nike yeah. before they wanted to wear Nike. For sure. And that was Michael Jordan primarily. Yeah, he became the face he became the, face, became of the face of it. It wasn't Phil Knight. No, Phil Knight right. was never the face of it. No. It, it was, really never has been. Yeah, and a whole other discussion. Nike is just a brand built off of influencer marketing. Yeah, yeah. right. But I tell you what, I, I, I but I but again, I would bet I, I'm I'm going to go look this up and we'll post it. But I would bet they spend far more in just advertising than they do on their paid sponsorships of athletes. Sure, and they spend a ton on those paid sponsorships with athletes. Yeah, but. On top of that, dude, they're still spending on online. They spend on commercials. They spend, right, to put their names on arenas and in arenas and on commercials. So 
you put all that together, like th this company isn't just doing influencer marketing. Yeah. Influencer marketing is how you get reach, how you get people to say like, oh, I like that. Sure. I recognize it. I want to be a part of that. Or I can see myself wearing that or I want to be like this person. Right. Same thing with what you're saying is you're turning the camera in and you got to turn it on yourself as a company. <laughs> can you imagine? And now people say, oh, I relate to that. I want to be like that. Or I, I could see myself wearing yeah. that. There's relatability and then there's also some storytelling, right? Yes. So like, imagine this. So Nike's doing a lot right. And they just have such a big brand presence that like, once again, like if you're, uh, you but might, again, that's how they grew. Yeah. You might yeah. not say, you might, we might not say that Nike is no, is no longer deemed as the running company, but there's no doubt that Nike becomes a part of a consideration when buying running shoes. Yes, but there's no doubt that their running section is still probably bigger than every for, D to C sure. running darling. But can you imagine, this yes. is something Nike's not doing. So right, Nike's nailing, signing the right athletes and they are delivering product to everybody who is going to potentially fit and, and, and help their brand, right? They're doing all that stuff. They're putting a ton of money into paid ads, of course. They're creating very, very high level um, content um, through content agencies or through their in-house team, whatever it might be. But one thing they're not doing, I can guarantee you that their organic, their organic profiles are not driving crazy amounts of brand new eyeballs. Of course they're not because they've already... But imagine this. They're in escape velocity. But imagine this. Imagine if Phil Knight, they turn Phil Knight into the face of Nike and they started a series of Phil Knight telling the story unique stories of Nike from back in the 80s to their IPO to today. And they were short three, you know, 160, 120 seconds to three minute stories of him almost clipping what Shoe Dog was or what Air is. So you're telling... So that's what you would do today. You're 100%. right. 100%. But they did that the same way in, in a similar way with Shoe Dog. Totally. But so, you start doing that. You start, I'm not disagreeing with yeah. you. What I'm saying to brands, though, to recognize is like people will say, well, yeah, my, Nike's not doing this thing. It's like, well, Nike is an escape velocity. <clears throat> like they've already like they're already known. Right. They don't need any help for people to know who Nike yeah. is anymore. So it's just about touch points. Et there's, not, there's not a single person who probably doesn't know who Nike is right. in the world. But they already did that in their time of growth. Yeah. But they could resurge and get um, yeah, more I'm people totally shouldn't. interested if they start doing something right. like this. Because you're right. Like, I bet if you look at their page, like, let's just pull up Nike running, for example. But if I pull up a Nike profile... It's probably going to be a campaign. It's going to be new product launches. It's yeah, it's like, it's, it's very maybe product... Maybe a new signing of an athlete. Focused. Yep. And it's very, very curated. But even then, like, if you look at... They're most liked. They released a really sick shoe. So, yeah, they're always going to get that kind of stuff. Right? That worked. But even this one, that that's their highest engaged post. It's yeah, just like 20,000 20, likes. That's 30,000. 30,000 likes is actually not that much. Then someone breakdancing wearing their stuff is like 40,000. For a company to that size. But I'm just telling you, like, if we go, so this is back to, and we'll, we'll start, for, we'll, we'll kind of end on this note. Brands, like, I'm telling you right now, there would be a resurge of people being becoming more and more interested in Nike if someone like Phil Knight, if Steve Wozniak, all of a sudden, they started telling stories from Steve Wozniak's perspective through Apple, who's not watching those? Everyone's watching those. I know you're thinking, but I'm right. <laughs> I don't know if you're right on that one. I am. From I that guy's angle, I think the guy who I got think the trashed, people that I think know? the people that already watch, like like it. Yeah, I mean, people would watch them. Totally, I would. I don't know if people it would sell any. I don't know. When you're top of mind, it sells. But again, like we're talking about companies that have reached it. Yeah. But but the point being is, you're right for companies in this age where it's like, hey, you're you're not a trillion dollar company. You know, yeah. like you're not even a billion dollar company. A lot of you. So, so you need as much distribution as possible. So how do you? Use get distribution in the channels where people are at a cost that's going to be effective. Yep, is the question. Ads is part of that, it always is, but the other part of it is reinvesting into the storytelling and going after that framework, which is doing what algorithms want you to do 
So not trying to find a hack, doing what algorithms not want. Not trying to find a trend. And delivering it in the taste that your cons- consumer yeah. wants to consume. Which is like... Like and- if you're an ice cream shop and you're delivering like pistachio ice cream but nobody wants it, you know, it's it's like, that's such a stupid example, but... yeah. And nobody wants it because nobody has a taste for that ice cream. No yeah. offense to pistachio ice cream people, but like who who's spending money on that? Yeah. You people are crazy. That's why you got to have the chocolates in there. So if you're delivering content, what taste does, do people want in that content creation? Like you said, it's going to be personalized storytelling. Yeah. Easy as that. Which is, in theory, cheap. Yes. But, but there's a if me- you're not the right person to do it, then it can be expensive and people don't want to invest, but they should. Well, and there's a cost of, I, like, there's a, uh, I know we keep saying we'll end. There's a cost of, there's a mental cost associated to that as well. I, I think we have a lot of founders, like we had Roxanne on the, was it two episodes ago, the Rookie Wellness founder? Yeah, circling back to self-care. Yeah, she, she was, she like, it, when you listen to that podcast, she was great. She was a great talking head. Yeah, she's amazing. But, like, ment- she had this, like, mental, like, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to get in front of a camera. I don't want to be the face. I don't want well, so there's there's, a, Yeah, there's a certain mental there's a, weight there's to putting yourself out there. There's a mental cost, yeah. for sure, for a lot of founders, um, that is, is, I think, a lot more scary than it actually really is when you do it. Because I have that, you know... I, I, it's not like I'm this this big content creator, but I usually create content every single day. But it, I mean, it, it like that first like three months of doing it f- three or four years ago was was agonizing. Yeah, it really was. And and I and I feel like I like to talk. I don't mind being in front of a camera. I don't mind. I can speak to twenty people just as good as I can speak to five hundred people. I might sweat a little more in front of five hundred people, but I I'm not any more nervous like mentally. But, it's funny because I can get up and speak in front of people or talk like this and I'm fine, but getting in front of a camera by myself, I'm like, ugh. It, totally. Like yeah. I said, it was, I mean, it, it was, it just gave me the heebie jeebies. I just hated the thought of it, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's a lot less scary than it actually really is, unless you're, unless it's a different fear of like, I am stage fright. That's different. Like, that's just different. Like, there's like, there's not a whole ton that you can, which ironically, some people have stage fright that are fine doing the camera. Sure, sure. So, all right. I don't know. But we'll nonetheless, there, but, it's following that system. So figure out what the algorithm wants you to do. We know Instagram wants you to post frequently videos, right? You got to also use the stories to get that engagement from more of like a, a like an everyday perspective. Yeah. Right? But how do you frame your company into the story of your customers? Yeah. Because that's how I would say it. it's like, what is the why of your customers? We've talked about that. Why should they care about you? Yeah. And how do you frame your story into the way they see themselves in the world? Yeah. You got to adapt too. That's the other thing. Adapt. It's not always your business is failing. It just could mean you're not adapting. Just could be everyone's hit a plateau and you're not. TLDR. It's evolution. Darwinism at its finest. There's a reason why the American cheetah does not exist anymore. (laughs) Yeah. You know? Yeah. I didn't know there was an American cheetah. There was. Absolutely. Wild. In fact, they say the pronghorns uh, evolved to run away from them, and now they're not around, so there's not a lot that can catch a pronghorn. Because they're super fast? They're crazy fast. Interesting. I've seen pronghorns in real life. Yeah. I've seen them. Yeah, I see them all the time. Here in Utah? Yeah. Really? I've only seen them in Oregon. What? Yeah, there's a golf course or one of my favorite golf courses is called Pronghorn. Dude, you just go out to the the West Desert. Oh, maybe. I thought I saw an antelope. I was just out in the West Desert, but I thought it was an antelope. But they kind of look, antelopes and pronghorns kind of look maybe a little similar. Well, technically they're not antelopes, but yeah. Oh, really? There's no such thing as an antelope in the United States. Antelope Island? Yeah. They just named it's it? Misnamed. Yeah. All Scientifically right, Scientifically speaking. Thank you so much for joining us. We won't talk about antelopes and pronghorns anymore, but we will see you guys next uh, week. Thank you so much for listening to the Unstoppable Marketer Podcast. 
please go rate and subscribe the podcast. Whether it's good or bad, we want to hear from you because we always want to make this podcast better. If you want to get in touch with me or give me any direct feedback, please go follow me and get in touch with me. I am at the Trevor Crump on both Instagram and TikTok. Thank you and we will see you next week.